Okay, so where we left off last time was kind of an understanding about the time domain behavior of systems, right? If I want to get the output for a given input, what I do is I take the convolution of the input with the impulse response. And we showed a bunch of different ways of doing that convolution. You did some on the homework. And you can see that that convolution process can be kind of tedious, right? You wouldn't want to have to do that every time you have a, a signal. And so the great strength of LTI signals is the ability to use what are called transform methods to make solving LTI systems easier. That means that we bring the input and the system and the output into some sort of new domain, which is going to be either the Fourier domain or the Z-transform domain. And that makes manipulating these LTI systems much, much easier, right? So what I want to talk about today is kind of the fundamental thing from which everything else derives, and that's the Fourier series. Okay. So generally, if I was to talk about Fourier analysis, what that means is the decomposition of a signal into sines and cosines, right? And so um, why do we care about sines and cosines? Well, it turns out that they naturally occur in a lot of situations. So certainly in terms of you know, mechanical contexts like swinging pendulums and spinning wheels and stuff like that, you have innate sinusoids. It comes up a lot in communications theory, right? So cell phones and AMF and radio and so on are built on things like carrier waves that are high-frequency sinusoids. And so uh, power signals also correspond to sinusoids. And so the nice thing is that LTI systems respond in a particularly special way to sinusoidal input. That's one of the reasons that we use Fourier transforms in the first place. And so the principle that we're going to derive today is basically that um, every uh, periodic continuous time signal can be written as a sum of sinusoids. And so what I want to do today is kind of derive how this works, both going from how do I take my, sing how do I take my signal and write it like a bunch of sinusoids, and how to go backwards if I have the sinusoids to reconstruct the original signal. OK. OK. So of course, let me just preface this by saying that in the real world, oftentimes we don't have purely periodic signals, but we'll relax this assumption that the signal has to be periodic uh, as we get to talking about the Fourier transform. You can basically think of an aperiodic signal as a signal whose period kind of tends to infinity. And so the idea is, um, assume today we have a periodic signal, x of t. And just as a reminder, what that means is that for every value of little t, this holds true. Right? That means that looking forward in time by t units, I get the same signal. And so, you know, such a signal looks something like this. You know, I maybe have some wiggly shape, and that does it again, and so on. Dot, dot, dot. And the implication is this periodicity goes on. Let's see if I can kind of draw this the right way. That's not bad. This kind of goes on to infinity, right? But really, there's only one unique part of the signal, and that's what occurs in any given 0 to t period. OK. So the first question is, what other signals have the same period, right? And the most natural signal that has a period is a sinusoid. OK. So let's think about, OK, so suppose that I want to constrain myself to talking about signals that have period t. So. What other signals have period t? Well, the easiest thing is to think about a sinusoid, right? And so if I wanted to talk about, for example, cosine of like this, like I could make a cosine wave that would oscillate nicely like this, right? And so what would be the formula for this cosine? Well, it would be cosine omega 0 t, right? Where I've defined omega 0 as the fundamental frequency 2 pi over t. Why is this true? 
Well, if I plug in capital T, I get cosine of 2 pi, which is 1. If I plug in capital 2T, I get cosine of 4 pi, which is also 1, and so on. OK. That's not the only cosine, though, that has that frequency, and so, or that, that has that period. I can also think about <laughs> cosines that wiggle faster. So if I were to look at this, so all of my pens kind of suck. OK. So now I need something that kind of is going to wiggle twice as fast, so something like this. Right, so this would be cosine of two omega naught t, or cosine of two times two pi over t. I guess I'm missing a t over here. Right, and you can kind of see by the same principle that I could have a cosine that wiggles three times within that interval, four times within that interval, and so on. And so generally, cosine of k omega zero t, where k is an integer. has this, you know, period. And also, you know, even though I've drawn these as cosines, I could also look at sines, right? So, I mean, if I draw a sine wave here instead, a sine wave looks like a cosine that's shifted over. So, a sine wave looks like this. And I can see that that signal also has period here. And so, I could also use uh, sine of k omega zero t, right? Okay. Questions so far? All right. So now we're going to kind of put it together and say, okay, so I can see that uh, if these guys each have period capital T, then so does this signal, which is a complex signal, right? If I decompose this with Euler's formula, I have cosine k omega t plus j <laughs> sine k omega zero t. Right? This is periodic, this is periodic, and they both have the same period. And so the real part and the imaginary part both look good. I don't want to close this word. So basically, this is okay, and so that means that um, similarly, if I were to look at any sum of such signals, right? So if I have cosine like omega zero t plus cosine two omega zero t, those guys are both going to be periodic with period t, and so I can look at the sum of any combination of these kinds of signals. So this is also periodic with period capital T. And so here, this can be basically be, you know, this is like a coefficient. And it doesn't matter what this is. This could be any complex number. Right? Because multiplying the signal by 2 or by 3 or by 1 plus j doesn't fundamentally change its period, right? It just changes its uh, amplitude and phase. Okay. And so this is kind of the, the philosophy of what we're going to do. We're going to try and take our signal x of t and make it look like the sum of a bunch of such, you know, uh, sinusoids at increasing frequencies. And so the problem we have to decide is how do we get these AKs, okay? How do we know what the AK should be that multiply each thing? And so a good way to think about this is just as like a, a change of basis, right? So I mean, uh, and this is going to be especially important as we get to the discrete time stuff. The idea is that we're changing from representing the signal by specifying what it does in every value of little t to just specifying these a sub k's. And here I only have to tell you a finite, well not a finite, but a, a discrete set of a k's, right? I have to tell you a0, a1, a2, a3, and then a minus 1, a minus 2, right? So I'm taking all of the x's and turning them into these a k's, okay? And that's what this transform is. Okay, and so let's kind of step back for a second and remind ourselves, so what is the kind of interpretation of these AKs, right? Well, if I look at K equals zero, right? Um, so K equals zero, that means that I have E to the J zero, right? Which is just one. 
So A0 basically looks like uh, a totally constant signal. So I'm basically saying I take A0, I multiply it times this signal. And then A1, what happens there? Well, that's like looking at cosine of omega 0t plus j sine of omega 0t. So it's kind of like saying I take A1 times cosine omega 0t plus j sine omega 0t. And let's just pause for a second and think about what happens with A minus 1. A minus 1 looks like cosine of minus omega 0t minus j sine, or I guess plus j sine minus omega 0t. I can kind of simplify that into a minus 1 times this cosine minus this sine. And so this is kind of a preview to say that, you know, the uh, a1 and a minus 1 definitely have a relationship, right? And we're going to talk about later on if for, for a real signal, which is, which is what we usually deal with in, in signal processing, you know, we can kind of predict what all the negative A's are going to be knowing what the positive values are going to be. So we'll come back to this. And so the fundamental interpretation of these guys, though, is that I've got A1 times things that are wiggling, you know, at the lowest frequency, and then A2 times things that are wiggling a little bit faster. I guess I should say plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, and so on. And so the interpretation is that, you know, as I increase the k, I get the coefficient on things that wiggle more and more. And, you know, it stands to reason that for most signals that we care about, the amount of wiggling that I have to take into account as k gets bigger and bigger, at some point these coefficients get probably smaller and smaller, right? Because a real world signal probably doesn't wiggle like crazy fast. I just need to have certain sums of cosines I need to get to make everything add up. So we talked about this earlier on, right? These are what would be called low frequency sinusoids. And as I go this way, I get higher frequency sinusoids. And this guy here, when we uh, have a constant, is called DC, right? That's like the constant <coughs> term. Okay. So questions so far? All right. So let's restate what we're trying to do here. So our goal is uh, represent x of t in this way. OK? And this is what's called the Fourier series. And it's called a series, right? If you remember back to calculus, a series is just a sum of terms, right? That's why it's called a series. OK. So this is kind of like what I would call the you know, synthesis equation. This means, how do I synthesize the signal from the AK. So if I'm given the AKs, this is how I add up the AKs to get back to the X, right? What we don't know right now is how do I analyze the signal? How do I take X and produce the AKs, right? So we need a formula for AK in terms of X. So uh, how to compute these AKs for a given X of T? Okay, well, we're going to assume initially that this property holds, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by a certain term, okay? So I'm going to fix n, right? So n is a fixed integer. Okay. So we're going to fix n, and we're going to multiply both sides by this extra exponential. OK. And so that means I can basically kind of collect these two terms together. <coughs> 
And now I'm going to integrate both sides from 0 to t. Okay. So let me keep this up here for a second. So now I'm going to integrate both sides from 0 to t. What that means is the following. here. Okay. And we're going to assume that everything is well behaved enough that I can switch the order of the sum and the integral on this side here. And this k I can take out because it doesn't depend on little t. So I'm left with this. Now I'm going to look at what is this right-hand side integral. Well, I'm going to split this up into cosines and sines to make it a little bit easier. So let me just take this guy by itself. So this integral here is like, you know, it's sometimes a little bit confusing to visualize complex integrals like this. So I'm going to just make it a little bit easier and say this is like cosine k minus n omega 0 t dt plus j times this integral. OK. So now life is a little bit easier because I know how to integrate you know, real signals. And so let's just think about you know, what is the value of this integral. So I remember k and n are integers, and I've kind of got the freedom to choose m, right? And so let's look at this. Let's suppose that, um, say that k equals n, right? Well, let's plug that in. That means that I've got integral of cosine 0, which is just 1, right? So this turns to this. Uh, what if k equals n over here? Well, uh, I've got this turns into integral of 0 to t sine 0, which is 0. Okay. So what can I conclude? I conclude that at least I know what happens for the k equals 0 term. The k equals 0 term is just capital T. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, the k equals n term. So for k equals n, the integral is capital T. Okay. Let's think about what happens when K is not equal to M. Okay. Let me just stop and ask. Questions on this? Okay. So let's happen let's look see what happens when I have something else here. So again, let's look at this. So I have uh, Let's suppose that k is not equal to n. Well, what I have is integral from 0 to t cosine of basically some integer omega 0 t dt plus j times the sine dot dot dot. Okay, let's just think about this for a second. So cosine integer k omega t, remember I had pictures like that before, right? So like these are the kinds of pictures that I have when I have cosine of an integer times omega 0 t. What it looks like is some cosine that wiggles within the period from 0 to t. And so if I think about what would, what would happen if I was to integrate one of these signals, right? Well, I would have just as much above the line as I would below the line, right? Because these signals just are going to have one or more full oscillations inside that inter interval. and so. That makes it really easy, right? I can see, for example, when I integrate the sine, I get this part cancels out entirely with this part, right? So no matter what the integer is, 
as long as I have an interval, integral number of ripples inside that zero g interval, the integral turns out to be zero, right? So that's great, right? So basically, this thing is going to have um, this signal oscillates an equal number of times inside this interval. That means the integral is zero. So that's pretty exciting because if I go back to this, this basically tells me that even though I've got this complicated sum of this you know, infinite number of integrals, only one of these integrals is actually not equal to zero. And the one that's not is when this k matches whatever this n I had here. And so that means that what I've shown is that this whole integral equals only the non-zero term, right? The only one that's not non-zero is when k is equal to n, and then this integral equals t. So what I have is a sub n times t. So that nasty looking integration actually turned out to be pretty straightforward. And so I can move this stuff around and just say, OK, that means that if I move the t over and I kind of substitute k equals n, what I have is this equation that tells me how do I get a specific coefficient. I get it by doing this integral. And this is called the analysis equation because I'm taking the original signal, I'm analyzing it down into the AKs. And so these AKs are called the Fourier series coefficients. Or sometimes you see these called the spectral coefficients. OK, so that's great. Any questions about this? So one thing to keep in mind, right, is that so far, really, you know, even though I know that in our class we're going to be mostly dealing with real valued signals, in general, this x of t can be a complex signal. And certainly these AKs are going to be complex numbers, right, because there's all these, you know, j's involved, right? So definitely in the general case, even if I have a real input, I'm going to get complex Fourier series coefficients, okay? Now that's not the end of the world, because like I kind of hinted at before, when the signal is real, we have some sort of... Uh, patterns in the AKs, okay? So what if X of T is real? So, you know, these coefficients are complex, but there are patterns. So what I mean by that is the following. So let's again take the synthesis formula. Right? This is how do I get the x from the coefficients. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the complex conjugate of both sides. And I'm going to put a little star to indicate complex conjugate. So basically, if I have you know some complex number, and I take the star of it, that's like just flipping the sign on the imaginary part. So that means I star everything over here. Well, I guess to be really, well, I, I guess I can jump right to this since this is a more advanced course, right? This is like saying that fundamentally uh, conjugating this part flips the sign on the exponential. And so now I can kind of compare these two things, right? Because I know that if x of t is real, so if uh, if z is real, z equals z conjugate, right? That's like saying that 
if I flip the sign of the imaginary part, nothing happens, right? Because there is no imaginary part. Okay, so I know that these things here have to be equal, which means that these things here have to be equal. And if I think about it, let me just write this in a slightly different way. This is like saying that if I reorder If I were to reorder the uh, numbers here, I can see that there is this pattern that says that AK equals A minus K conjugate. What does that mean? So for example, it means that if a1 is equal to 1 plus 2j, then a minus 1 is equal to 1 minus 2j. So fundamentally, there's only the set of positive ak's I need to keep track of because I can immediately compute the negative ak's, right? And you can compute for yourself through the magic of uh, how these complex numbers interact that even though there are lots of complex numbers multiplying these complex exponentials, when a signal is real, all the imaginary stuff drops away. Okay, so questions about that? Yes? Oh, the reason I did this was just to kind of say that here, you know, I wanted to make the, uh, so here it's like I'm multiplying by e to the negative something, and I wanted to do a change of variables to make it look like this so I could compare the two directly, right? So here it's like I'm sorting the k in the wrong order, and here the l is going in the right order. Other questions or comments? OK. So one thing that I'll maybe come back to is just mention. I'm, I'm debating whether to assign this as a homework problem or not. So one thing to mention is that um, for x of t real, we can also write things in a certain different way, right? I could basically say that x of t is equal to uh, something like this. So what does this mean? Well, the idea here is that when the signal is real, the intuition is I should be able to make that signal out of a bunch of real cosines, right? Real <coughs> sinusoids. But the problem is that you know I can't assume that I can just add all those sinusoids up starting at zero, right? So for example, suppose that I had you know suppose I wanted to make this look like you know the sum of a bunch of sine waves, right? each of those sine waves is zero at t equals zero, right? And if my signal's not zero there, there's no way that I could make that signal up out of the sine waves. What I need to do is I need to shift every one of these waves a little bit. And so that's why for each of the sinusoids, there is kind of an amplitude, and there is a phase. And so kind of an alternate way of writing the Fourier series is computing the amplitude and the phase of these real cosines. And so these are computable from the AK. <coughs> and so it's not hard to prove how to get there. Another thing that you can do if you don't like the phase is to write things like this, where I have just the sum of a bunch of non-shifted cosines and sines. So in this way, there's no phase shift, and I'm saying I add a little bit of this cosine, a little bit of this sine at the same frequency, right? And so again, now the things I have to compute are these things, which are also related to the AKs. So, Usually in this class, certainly to be consistent with all the stuff that's going to happen later, 
I don't usually write things in this form just because we need the complex exponentials to make sense of other stuff like the uh, FFT and so on, right? But this is useful to know, right? And it's a good exercise to, sh to kind of convince yourself how I can go back and forth between these representations. And so as I said, I may decide to assign this as a, as a problem. Okay. So to make this more concrete, let's do some examples, okay? Just to make sure that we understand how to take a real signal and convert it into the Fourier series coefficients. So, questions or comments so far? Yes? So, before when we were looking at the uh, series of complex exponentials, mm -hmm. um, there was just one variable to define, right? And now there's two variables. Is that because uh, the, the limits on the sum have changed by half the number? Oh, I see. You're talking about this limit? No. Yeah, because like, now there's two variables. Right. It's just A, it's OK, right? Right. So, kind of the way to think about this is that, you know, you always have, uh, well, so so the one thing to think about is that here, each of the A's is a complex number, right? But there are really, for a real signal, only two kind of numbers to determine for every absolute value of K, right? So if I know that A1 is 1 plus 2J, I already know what A minus 1 is, right? So the Fourier series kind of like for the one frequency uh, sinusoid is determined by these two numbers, okay? And these are just different ways of writing these two numbers, right? So here I have two real numbers. Here I have two real numbers, right? And I've changed the limits on the sum to reflect the fact that I don't need to use these negative, you know, sinusoids anymore. I'm kind of being more explicit about representing things in terms of only summing from k equals one, which is the lowest non-DC frequency up to the top, right? Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. From complex, uh, right. Real right. Yeah. So keep in mind, this only applies to when I have real signals, right? If I don't have real signals, it's entirely possible for A1 and A minus 1 to be totally unrelated to each other, right? In that case, you don't get anything for free. Then I have to compute two numbers for every value of K, positive or negative. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay. So, do a couple examples. So let's first do an easy example. So here is a signal that is clearly uh, periodic. Okay. So what are the AKs going to be? Okay. Well, um, if I wanted to, I could have. I would have to compute this integral. So you look at this and you say, oh man, you know, I gotta multiply this cosine by this complex exponential, I gotta expand it all out, you know, it's a pain, right? But one thing to realize is that whenever you have something that is strictly visibly a sum of cosines, you can immediately figure out what the Fourier series is. And the reason for that is that I can take this and I can write it as, you know, I can turn it into the complex world, right? So what is cosine of omega zero t? It's the same as e to the j omega zero t plus e to the minus j omega zero t, right? We talked about the, that decomposition on the first day, and so I can write this like five plus e to the j omega zero t plus e to the minus j omega zero t, right? And this is exactly like, you know, the the Fourier series decomposition, right? When I think about what the Fourier series decomposition says, it's exactly like this, right? It's telling me what should the weight be on every one of these things, and I can match up. I can do pattern matching and say, oh, this means that A0 is equal to 5, A1 is equal to 1, A2 is also equal to 1, I'm sorry, A minus 1 is also equal to 1. It's a crappy minus 1. A minus 1. And all other AK are equal to zero. Right? So life is pretty easy in this case, right? I can always just kind of read off what is the Fourier series. And just as a side note, since this is a real signal, right, I can see that these guys indeed obey my complex conjugation property, right? These guys are complex conjugates of each other. They happen to have no imaginary part, but still, 
everything works, right? So when you see a signal like this, you can just kind of read off the Fourier series, okay? But as you may remember from a continuous time signal system class, life is not always so easy. So let's talk about the uh, kind of real world case where I have to use an integration. So let's consider this signal. And this is you know, like the standard first signal that you see, a pulse train. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a pulse like this. That is going to be 1 between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And since the signal has to be periodic, this guy is going to repeat. Okay. So first of all, I think about what is the period of this signal. Well, this thing is repeating every 2 pi units. And so my fundamental frequency is 2 pi over t, which is just 1, right? So that makes things a little bit easier to work with. OK. <laughs> so let's look at the integrals we have to do. So let's first think about the DC term. The DC term is 1 over t, integral from 0 to t, of x of t, e to the minus j times 0 times omega 0, whatever that is, times t dt. And I can see that no matter what's happening, this thing is always going to be equal to 1, right? So this is just like saying it's this integral here. And another way of thinking about this is that no matter what the signal is, this is the average value of the signal over one period. Okay. And so here I can look at the signal and I can say, well, you know, in my case, I could do an integral like this. Or I could just kind of look at the signal and say, well, if I wanted to really go through this, I would do this like this. Right? Usually, if you're good at pictures, you can pick off what is the A0 term, right? It's the average value of the signal. <coughs> Here I can see that this signal over one period is on half the time and off half the time, right? So it's one half the time and zero half the time, so it can immediately kind of tell that the DC value is going to be one half, okay? So oftentimes, you don't actually have to do a real hardcore integral to get this, okay? You can just kind of observe it. Another thing that I was kind of quick to do here that I should maybe explain is that you notice that I kind of jumped from this integral to this integral, right? So I mean, if I was being really proper, I should have said this, right? Zero to two pi, which is true. But the way to think about this is that, you know, no matter what interval of length t I choose to do, I'm always going to have the same amount of stuff inside, right? That's because the signal is periodic with period t, right? So I can choose any interval of width t that makes sense for me to integrate on, right? So for example, here, I really don't want to integrate this signal because I have like two pieces I have to integrate, whereas if I chose this interval, I have this nice symmetric pulse, right? So in general, you should kind of choose the interval that makes sense to you, okay? You can choose any interval there. Okay, so know the DC value. Let's think about what is the general case, okay? Well, let's look at AK. I have integral, so let me write down the general formula first. Um, so here, for example, I'm going to use the fact that I can change my limits to be any interval of length t. And now let's plug in what do I know. I know that the period is 2 pi. So this can go from minus pi to pi. Uh, and that means that my omega 0 turns into 1. So my thing looks like this. And now let's look back at what this picture looks like. Well, this is kind of like, again, saying what happens between minus pi and pi. Well, it's going to turn the limits of the integral into minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. And in that region, it's going to be equal to 1. So I can kind of immediately step this into this. 
Now this looks like something I can handle. So let's just say that I'm sitting some stuff under the rug here by treating this like it's a normal real integral. But for the sake of argument, let's suppose that I just treat it like I'm doing a real value integral like this. And now I plug in, so I'm going to get uh, minus 1 over 2 pi j k e to the minus j k pi over 2 minus e to the plus j k pi over 2. And I can do a little bit better with this. I can say this is like 1 over uh, pi k times 1 over 2j times e to the j k pi over 2 minus e to the minus j k pi over 2. This is my formula for sine, right? So this is like saying sine k pi over 2 over pi k. And so I got down to a relatively simple formula, right? So for example, that's like saying that a1 is equal to sine 1 pi over 2 over pi. Sine pi over 2, right, if I think about it, is this guy here. So that's just 1. So I have 1 over pi. By, uh, since I know that the signal is real, I can immediately determine that I get the same value like this because of the complex conjugate symmetry. If I plug in A2, I get sine pi over 2 pi. Sine pi is over here, so that's 0. So I'm going to get 0. Right? And what you'll see here is this kind of alternating pattern of zeros and non-zeros. Okay? So let me just also say one more thing. So sometimes here, you know, you <coughs> probably are used to seeing these things called sync functions, right? And so let me just make a note that if I define sine sync x as sine x over x, then what I kind of have here is this looks like uh, what is this going to be? This is like two sync k pi over two. Is that right? I think so. Convince myself of this. I guess it's actually uh, it's actually a half of this, right? Yeah. So another way of writing this is going to be one half sync of k pi over two. So sometimes you see people defining sync in uh, different ways. Sometimes you see people defining sync as sine pi x over pi x. That's why sometimes you have a different definition of, of that. But this is a handy abbreviation for when you have sine x over x. We see that a lot, especially when we're dealing with these pulses. Okay. Okay. So to make this a little bit more uh, graphical, so there's a nice applet that you can find. This is, I found it on a website called falstad.com. So here basically what you have is, again, here's a pulse. And the idea is that as I, um, I'm going to click back two phases. So as I add numbers of terms, I get successive approximations. I'm sorry, I have to make this a little bit smaller. I get successive approximations to the sinus, right? So it's kind of like saying that um, I have a DC term, and then I, as I add more terms, I get a better and better approximation the signal. And here, what you can see is that the heights of these magnitudes are indeed, well, this is nice, I didn't realize I could do this. 
are indeed basically you know, 1 over pi, 3 over pi, 5 over pi, and so on. So the, the heights of the coefficients are decreasing. And as I add more coefficients, the signal becomes a better and better approximation to the square wave. And so if I really crank up the number of terms, eventually you see that the approximation is quite good. <coughs> there is a little bit of slop or overshoot at the edges, which is this. And so we're going to talk about that in just a second. I guess if I hover over the, I did something here. I guess it's just the frequency of the sinusoid I'm adding. So basically what I want to talk about in a second is why are there these kind of shoulders, these overshoots and undershoots around the edges? Um, that has to do with the fact that the signal is not continuous. It actually has this jump. But if you do the same kind of decomposition for different signals, right? So here, for example, let's take this back to, here's the DC of this triangle. If I add one term, you know, a sinusoid is already a pretty good approximation to this triangle. And as I add more approximations, I only make it better and better, right? So I kind of start to force the sinusoid up into this corner at the top and the bottom to make the approximation better and better. Eventually, you know, after not that many terms, the approximation looks about as good as the original did, right? So this also kind of starts to suggest ways in which I could use transform methods like Fourier series to help me with compression, right? Because if I only wanted to send, say, 10 numbers to represent this entire periodic signal, I could just say send the first 10 Fourier series coefficients and I should do pretty well, right? And here, one thing you notice is that the approximation is much better than for the same number of coefficients for the square wave. And that, again, has to do with the fact that the triangle is continuous, whereas the square wave is not. Here's another kind of triangular-like signal. This is a, what I would call a sawtooth. And so on the homework, I have you doing something similar to this, where I, as I add more terms, you know, the first approximation is not so good. Second one is a little bit better. And then slowly, things start to improve, right? Again, one thing that you can see here is that these sine waves are increasingly trying to bring the slope of that line where the discontinuity is up to basically being positive infinity. So as I increase the number of terms, you know, the slope of that line gets steeper and steeper, although I still never really lose this little overshoot here. Um, and let's see what noise is, right? So this is maybe not the best example, but I'm just curious. So if I have periodic noise, you know, even still, if I crank up the number of terms, eventually I can even get, you know, a noisy signal to match up with all these Fourier coefficients. But here I clearly don't have enough Fourier coefficients yet to make the noise, right? So I would need a lot more than I would for, you know, a triangle or a sawtooth or a square. So the simpler the signal, the fewer Fourier series coefficients I would need to represent it accurately. And so one thing you notice here is that, we'll talk about this in just a second, but so again, let's take a look at the square wave. So what happens as I shift the wave left and right? So the intuition is that really I shouldn't be changing the uh, amount of every cosine or sine that I need to make up that signal. All I'm doing is I'm changing the phases of the underlying sinusoids, right? So here, as I move the phase shift around, what you're going to see is that the magnitudes of the Fourier series coefficients don't change, and the phases change, right? So that's just like saying I'm multiplying the complex number, I'm multiplying the AK by some complex number who has a magnitude of 1, right? I'm just shifting that phase around. You could also view the signal decomposition as cosines and sines, right? And so here, if I go back to um, square wave, so here, this kind of shows that uh, I can make up this signal fully out of signs, right? And so if I go back to what I'm looking at here really is this alternate decomposition, right? Which you can't see, right? I'm looking at this alternate decomposition where I can say how much of a cosine do I need and how much of a sine do I need, right? If I look back at my um, AKs that I did in this example, I can see that my decomposition is fundamentally made up out of sine functions, right? So there are no cosines. And I can see that reflected in my, uh, I can see that reflected in this picture. Now, if I start to change the phase of this, then I'm going to need, you know, 
some sines and some cosines, until eventually if I align the signal so it's purely even, then I can make the signal purely out of cosines. And so I can maybe kind of see this, if this will work. So as I start to shift it, here I've added some sines and cosines into the mix together. But as the signal approaches being even, here, now I have got no sine input and all cosine input, right? And again, that makes sense, because it's an even signal. I should be able to make it out of other even signals, right? And again, just to, just to refresh, this doesn't change the magnitude of the AKs, right? All I'm doing is I'm kind of shifting things around. OK. So I'll post this falstad.com you know, Fourier series thing on Piazza so you can pull around it yourself. But any questions about this? So hopefully this makes things a little bit more, more graphical. Um, you know, one thing that I don't think that I can do with this interface is, um, you know, in some sense, the square wave here, I kind of got lucky because it's half on and half off. And so when I, uh, you know, when I decrease the number of terms, the first sinusoid already looks pretty good, right? Um, but it would be more interesting to say what happens when I don't have a pulse that is exactly half as wide as the period, right? It turns out things will still work. It just takes me a little bit longer to converge to get there. Okay, and again, that's a pretty standard problem. And so, one thing that you're going to find on your homework is that you know, just you know, so you're not worried about doing a zillion integrals. What I'm going to do is give you a sheet of you know common Fourier series pairs. In fact, maybe in this case, all I'm going to give you is the Fourier series for the pulse. And it turns out you can derive a lot of stuff from that just using properties of the Fourier series, right? So I'm not going to ask you to do a zillion integrals on the homework. I'm going to ask you to jockey the properties around and use known signals, okay? So let's talk about the properties for a second uh, because that's what makes life worthwhile here. Um, okay. So, find my other pages and notes here. So let me just make a couple comments about Fourier series in general. Um, so. I derived the Fourier series kind of with the implicit uh, expectation and understanding that it existed, right? So if, if you were a true mathematician, you'd notice a bunch of mistakes I made when I derived this, right? The first thing was assuming what I was trying to prove, which was the Fourier series even existed in the first place, right? It may not exist for some signals. The other thing is that I kind of was a little bit casual about the way I did those integrals involving complex functions. If you want to really know how to do complex function integrals the right way, you should be taking a complex analysis class and understanding that there are you know, certain ways of doing that that are not the same as doing real integrals, right? So an electrical engineer generally should take a course on complex analysis, I think, which goes well beyond understanding what complex numbers are, but understanding how to do complex integrals and how complex functions behave, right? So for example, we don't require it for our RPI undergraduate curriculum, but if you were an RPI graduate student, we would expect you to understand complex analysis, right? So there's a whole course in math called complex analysis that I recommend that you look into if you're interested in learning more. Okay, so let me just make some, some comments about uh, notes and properties. of the Fourier series. Okay, so most of the time life is good. I can take a periodic signal and I can represent in terms of these Fourier series coefficients, okay? So there are a few pathological cases where you can't do this and it's worth just mentioning that they exist and what they are. So when doesn't it work? And you're unlikely to encounter these situations in your natural life, but one reason that it might not work is maybe you have something that has like a crazy asymptote. Right? Something like this where the signal approaches the asymptote but never gets there. That is a periodic signal, but you can't make the Fourier series out of it. Um, so this is kind of like a problem with kind of infinite area under the curve. No can do. The next one that is equally pathological would be something like what I would technically call infinite wiggling. And what I mean by that is that you can imagine some sort of crazy signal that 
as I approach the, you know, as I approach the period, I wiggle faster and faster so that I kind of never get there, right? It's kind of like one of these Zeno's arrow kind of paradoxes, right? Where I can kind of keep on making my instantaneous wiggling higher and higher frequency so that I never really actually hit this, you know, value here. Okay. Another thing that would be like kind of pathological would be like infinite discontinuities. And what I mean there is that, you know, again, I could have something like, you know, I have a discontinuity here, and I have discontinuity here and here. So kind of like I have discontinuity every half step. And life is not good there either, okay? But again, you rarely get into these kinds of situations, right? I mean, why would you? Question? So, for example, for the first one, as a top, if there's finite area under the curve, is it still possible to do the Fourier series? Well, if there's finite area under the curve, is it still possible to do the Fourier series? Uh, that's a good question. My, well, I, I guess I did say infinite area, right? So, if there's finite area under the curve, Seems like the kind of answer I should know, but I'm not sure it's off my head. Um, my gut reaction is that not possible. Um, but I have to go back and check. Okay. Seems like I should know that, but fair enough. Okay. So, other questions? Don't let me stop. So, um, I mentioned discontinuities here. Let's talk about what does happen at discontinuity. So a finite number of discontinuities is okay. We actually already kind of saw that with the square wave. So what happens at a discontinuity? Well, the way I think about this is basically, um, you know, the Fourier series converges at every continuous point and it converges to the average value at every discontinuity. Again, what do I mean by this? Well, let's take a look again at the square wave. So here, you can see that no matter how many terms I add, the value here, where the signal is discontinuous, is zero, right? So you know, the value is plus one on one side of this continuity, it's minus one on the other side, and no matter how many terms I add, the red signal is always gonna be splitting the difference, right? So I'm never gonna be able to do better than that. And I guess that kind of makes sense, right? I mean. Um, Whereas a triangle that has no discontinuities, right, this is a continuous signal, you know, then there's no problem with convergence. At every point, the Fourier series will converge, and that's why when I add a whole bunch of terms, everything looks so good, right? Whereas with the square wave, you know, I'm always going to have this kind of problem of not knowing exactly what to do here. But I mean, one thing you'll notice kind of as a, as a parallel thing is that the slope at the discontinuity approaches infinity, right? So I get a steeper and steeper curve but I'm always going to split the difference as to where that actually hits the discontinuity. Okay. I also want to talk uh, briefly about just this, this shoulder here, right? The fact that there's this hump. And so, oops, go away. So the Gibbs phenomenon is the name for this behavior that happens at a discontinuity, right? So what you saw here in my quality drawing style is something like this, right? And the fact is that this is where the thing converges to and the Gibbs phenomenon basically tells me that the uh, we can never get the overshoot below approximately 9% of the height of the discontinuity. 
right? So I take how high this is, right? So if this thing is one high, that means that this height is never going to be less than 9% of the height, right? But on the plus side, if you look again at the picture, the region where that little shoulder is a problem gets smaller and smaller, right? Because like I said by these properties, at every continuous point, the Fourier series converges, right? That means that if I keep on adding terms, eventually the Fourier series will be continuous all the way across this top bar. And that's true. If I really amp up the number of terms, eventually it looks like I have a red straight line here, but the height of this thing never gets any smaller at the exact point just before this continuity. That's always going to be there. But if I were to, for example, integrate out the error, my integral error will get smaller and smaller because the width of that little shoulder is getting narrower and narrower, right? So it's, it becomes a decreasing problem as I add more terms, but I can never get rid of it, right? So here you can kind of see how it works. And so that's called the Gibbs phenomenon. Okay. So let me give you some properties of the Fourier series. This is what I want you to use on the first problem of the homework. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to redo the Fourier series stuff that you did in signals by too much. I just want to remind you of what the Fourier series is, because it turns out that the DFT, the, the thing that is basically under the hood of the MATLAB fast Fourier transform, is like a discrete version of the Fourier series. And so it's important to understand why we're, we're doing the Fourier series in the first place. So properties that make you know, Fourier series easier to work with. OK. So let's suppose that we have um, some signal. It's periodic with period t. Um, and it has Fourier series given by this a sub k set. Okay. Sometimes for ease of notation, I'll say something like this, right? That this is the time domain side, this is the Fourier domain side. Okay. And so one nice thing is linearity. What th this means is that if I have two signals that have given Fourier series and they both have the same period, then if I were to combine these two signals with a linear combination, the corresponding Fourier series is exactly what I expect. Right? That's good. That means I don't have to screw around with, you know, computing the Fourier series from scratch. Okay. Next one is time shifting. And that's kind of what I showed you in that little applet. The idea being that if I have some sort of a periodic signal, I kind of suck at drawing this part. If I were to shift this over by some phase shift, Right, so if I just shift this over by some you know, constant phase shift, the idea is that the contents of the shifted signal in terms of the frequency domain shouldn't really change. The only thing that should change is the phase of the corresponding Fourier series coefficients. And so that means that if I have um, the Fourier series coefficients of the original signal, and then I let y of t equal a time-shifted version of the original signal, a delayed version, then the Fourier series coefficients of y are simply shifted by this. Right? What this means is that uh, you know I have a phase shift of the Fourier series coefficients. The magnitude doesn't change. 
Right? We saw that in the applet. And again, it's a good practice just to remind yourself, like when you see when you see a number like this, right? That is just a, a point somewhere on the circle in the complex plane, right? That's a point somewhere on the unit circle where I have, you know, cosine this thing plus sine this thing plus j sine this thing. And so as long as I'm on the unit circle, the magnitude of this thing is always going to be equal to 1, right? And so that's worth appreciating. That another way of saying this is the magnitude of these bk's doesn't change at all. Same magnitude is different phase. OK. So a common one that you're going to want to use is differentiation. That one comes into play on the homework. So differentiation basically says that if I have the Fourier series like this, that if I take the derivative of the signal, what I get is j k omega 0 a k. This one is easy to prove, actually, so let me just do it. So if I have the Fourier series synthesis formula, and I take the derivative of both sides, I get this derivative here, and then I get a k j k omega 0 e to the j k omega 0 t. And I can see that these guys are indeed the Fourier series coefficients for the new derivative, right? And so this is what you're going to do on the homework because I'm giving you a <coughs> triangular wave. And the idea is you convert that triangular wave into a square wave. And then you figure out what the coefficients are for the square wave. And you undo it to get back to the triangle wave. You probably did similar problems like this uh, when you took signals. Um, a couple other useful things. One is called Percival's theorem. This basically says that if I look at the average power of the signal, that that's the same thing as looking at the power of the Fourier series coefficients. So this is kind of a slangy way of saying that there's the same amount of power in the time domain as there is in the frequency domain. <coughs> or if you want it to be really slangy, say something like that, that there's no information lost by converting between the two domains. Okay. Okay. So another key one is convolution. And this is honestly why we care about transform domain methods in the first place. So if I have two time domain signals, then if I multiply them in the time domain, what I get is kind of the equivalent of convolving these two sets of numbers, right? So I can think about A as a discrete time signal. And I can think about B as a discrete time signal. And so I can kind of think about this as like conv the convolution of the two vectors of Fourier series coefficients. And, you know, to be honest, this is not really the uh, direction that we normally care about. A better way to think about it is that if I'm doing uh, this, so if I'm doing this integral, this is like the convolution integral that I would have to do if I was doing continuous time uh, LTI systems, then the Fourier series coefficients of the result are basically multiplied together, right? This is really the property that we care about the most for LTI systems is that multiplication in one domain becomes convolution in the other domain, right? So typically, 
we take time domain convolution and we turn it into frequency domain multiplication. And that makes life much easier. So we're going to drill on this concept a little bit more deeply when it comes to discrete time stuff. I don't want to really belabor the you know, uh, Fourier series and continuous time stuff too much. I just want to make sure that we all remember what the Fourier series is and what it means. OK. OK. So comments or questions on any of that? All right. So with that, let me shut down my recording.